We are a part of something so much greater, so far beyond anything that's happening in the United States of America on Tuesday. Many of you have already voted, so thank you for doing so. And uh, some of you will st still be voting. And so thank you for fulfilling what I believe is your God-given obligation as citizens of the United States of America, given and being entrusted by God to govern your nation and to have a voice in that. That is something that God has not entrusted to every nation in the world, but he has entrusted it to us. So by virtue of that, I would say that it falls upon us as Christians as an obligation to vote. And to vote the values that God has outlined for us in, in Scripture. And so we, we pray, just as Jesus taught us, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I'm so thankful that we can start a week like this, the first day of the week, the first hours of the week, getting to fall before our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in complete submission to him, and to acknowledge his greatness. Man, that's, that's what we need with every fiber of our being because we are a part of something so much greater than a national election. And so, man, I thank God for that. And if you would, uh, would you join me in prayer? Let's, let's pray for our country. Father, thank you uh, that your name is greater and far beyond all other names, uh, far beyond all powers, and dominions and thrones of men, anything that, uh, anyone that could be in power, any government that can be in power, any nation that might rise above all other nations just pales in comparison to you. And so thank you that you're the one that we can put our hope and trust in. Uh, not our country, not politicians, not political processes, and so, God, as, as we vote, we trust you, and, and we trust you with the outcomes. We just want to be faithful to you. And God, I would pray for our future president that you would give them foresight and uh, the, the discernment to understand what their decisions mean for successive generations, that, that they would seek your wisdom and humbly submit themselves to, to your leadership that you would give them wisdom to engage in all of the challenges, in, not only in our country, but on a global scale with environmental challenges and immigration and wars and rumors of wars, humanitarian crises. God, that they would also, by their policies, by their very dispositions, that they would encourage and foster faith in you to flourish and never allow our government to interfere with the genuine expression of our faith, even if that means that it goes against their political party and ideologies. So God, for us as a church, uh, for the church at large, never let us as Christians become so partisan that we become more Republican or Democrat than we are Christians. Father, as important as this election might be in earthly terms, we acknowledge that it pales in comparison to the wonder, the beauty, the mission of your church, the unity of your church. God, so lift our vision higher than the horizon of this election. Let us not live in fear no matter the outcome because that's not what you've given to us. You've promised us, you've told us, you have not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. That's the confidence that we want to live in. And God, I don't doubt that there are people here this morning, maybe even joining us online, whose fears are so much bigger than what awaits our country next. They have things going on in their personal lives that, uh, touch them so deeply to the core of their being that they have greater reasons to fear that are so much more closer to home. And God, I pray that you would meet them 
in whatever those needs are. Thank you that you are a God who redeems and restores and heals. You're our great comforter. You're our great physician. You are God Almighty. You are holy. And you are able. And we can put our trust in you. So God, whatever those things are, that the burdens that we may be carrying, thank you for being a God who wants to walk alongside us and shoulder those burdens with us. Thank you that we can cast all our cares upon you because you care for us. In Jesus' name, amen. As we were looking at the calendar uh, many, many months ago and anticipating the election, I thought it would be really important and helpful for us to get a better view of things that are bigger than us, bigger than us as Christians, bigger than us as a church, bigger than us than a political election cycle, as important as those things might be, and to shift focus on what's going on globally as far as the gospel's concerned. Because no matter what the outcome is at the polls, the most important thing to us is the salvation of souls. That, that has to be where our focus is. No matter what else in the world is going on, that's the mission that Jesus Christ has given to us. And so this morning, I am so, so glad to have John Hanksing with us from India. If you've been around, you know five years ago, uh, John served as an intern with us over the summer and impacted uh, so many of us, especially our young people, in very profound and deep ways, and especially my own children. And I will forever be thankful for John, his, his ministry, his love for God and his word and for people. Uh, you're going to get a taste of that this morning, and it's so important that that's what we anchor our hearts to as we anticipate this election and all the topsy-turvy, whatever, whatever's in store for our country in the coming days. And to get a glimpse, too, at the work that God is doing in other locations in the world, uh, the work that John and his wife Grace and his parents are, that they're leading in India is absolutely incredible. Um, they are movers and shakers for Jesus Christ, and it's amazing to see what God is doing in, in other contexts. So would you please welcome John Hangsing? Well, good morning, Grace Baptist Church. It is a joy for me to be back worshiping with you. I worshiped first with you on the first service, and it's uh, such a joy and honor to be back. And I want to personally thank Pastor Jeff, Pastor Zach, and all, all of you who've invested so much in me and my life and my parents' ministry. I am, as Pastor Jeff said, I will forever be indebted for your love, the way you've received me. It is just amazing. And I am just an extension of what you have done uh, in my life and what God continues to do in India. So from the bottom of my heart, sometimes words are just not enough, but I want to say to all of you, thank you. And it's good to see familiar faces, and, and I hope to connect with you after service. Let's get going. Well, you know, inspiration is a powerful thing. Inspiration ignites in us a desire a motivation to some, achieve something that is beyond the ordinary. For me, that inspiration came as a seventh grader. I come from a culture where if you walk the streets or in school, you lock eyes with someone, it probably means you want to fight. So as a seventh grader, 13-year-old, I was still trying to find my life, my identity, and I kind of wanted to stand out as one of the strongest guy in class. And unbeknownst to me, one night, as me and my family were watching the TV, Rocky IV came up. And as I looked at Rocky, at that moment, Rocky was the hero I needed. In a sense, he was my savior. Of course, Jesus is the only savior. And the next morning, I did everything that Rocky did. Woke up at around 4 a.m. in the morning, cracked a few raw eggs, drank, and ran around the town. That carried me on for a year, 
but you know that such inspirations don't really last that long. But what I'm trying to say is in Rocky IV, there's this particular uh, story, it's a story of an underdog, where Rocky's best friend, Apollo Creed, is killed by Ivan Drago, the towering, strong, massive Russian boxer in an exhibition match. And Rocky is filled with, you know, anger and vengeance, and he wants to avenge the death of his friend. So he goes over to Russia to train, and as they're fighting, a lot of the people say that there's no chance Rocky is a match for Drago, who is way stronger, way more skillful, way more technique. So around the 10th or 12th round, the commentators say, forget skill, forget technique. It's about who wanted the most. It is about digging deep from the tank of will and motivation and the desire to win. And with that, he wins because of his desire to win. It wasn't about skill anymore because he made it a brawl. It was about digging deep from the tank of will and desire. I say this this morning, church, because even in life, even in ministry, wherever we serve, be it here at Grace or be it back in India, if we keep on living on serving, there will be times in life and in ministry that we need to dig deep. The bottom line is, at times, or for the most time, we are not strong enough within ourselves but we need to rely on the strength and the grace that only God himself provides because it is God working in and through us, not us working for God. One preacher has said this, God is not initially interested in making us strong, but in causing us to be weak so that we find our strength is in him. God is not initially interested in making us strong, but in causing us to be weak so that we find that our strength is in Him. And when you think of Christianity, this is what people or theologians might call the paradox of the Christian life. A paradox is something that seems like contradictory or untrue, but as you acutely examine and experience it, it seems to be true. For example, Paul says, when I am weak, then I am strong. Strength in weakness or life through death. And it's truly said that to live Christianly means to live paradoxically. Sometimes it doesn't make sense, but it seems like that is the only way to live. Because this morning, as we look at Jesus and his cross and his glory, I truly contend that it leaves no room for you and I, for pride, for self-glorification, and trust in our, in our own strength and abilities, but only to live in humble dependence, in humility upon our Lord, if we are to make a difference for the gospel of Jesus Christ. But like I said, if we are to make a difference, sometimes difficulties will come. And when such times comes, what we do, what we have to do like Rocky did in his fight, is we have to dig deep when the trials come. We have to persevere and cling to our Savior, His grace, His word, His cross, and if I were to point out an example from the Bible this morning, I believe nobody does it better than the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. So if you have your Bible, would you turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4? 2 Corinthians is a Paul biographical statement of why he does not lose heart in life and ministry when difficult time comes. And chapter, uh, chapter 4 verse 7 says, here it reads, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the all-surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show the all-surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. To give you a bit of a background, 2 Corinthians is Paul's heartfelt letter. And to give you an example why, a group of people called the super apostles had arose and they boasted in their eloquence, their higher philosophy and prosperity. And when they look at Paul going through all the trials and persecution and imprisonment, for them, Paul's suffering, his homelessness or his uh, you know, suffering persecution is indicative of the fact that he's not a true apostle. The super apostles claim that because of Paul's suffering for the sake of the gospel, he's no real apostle. He is just no, he's no poster boy for the gospel. But here in it, Paul in chapter 3 writes that his defense is simply rooted in his Savior Christ in the cross. Now, we know that Paul could have boasted in all of his credentials, 
in his accolades as a Jew, as a Benjamite, and his knowledge of the law, and everything, but he put everything aside. His boast, his victory, was hidden in the cross of Jesus Christ, his death, and his res resurrection. And that is why he does not lose heart. And this morning, I want to tell you, our boast, our confidence, is nothing, as the song says, I will not boast in anything, no give no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. And that is what you and I need. So this morning, we learn about why Paul does not lose heart. Like Paul, in the midst of suffering and persecution and trial, why do we press on? Why do we not lose heart? Firstly, we see from the life of Paul, from the example of Paul, we do not lose heart because we have received God's mercy. We do not lose heart because we have received God's mercy. God, in His grace and mercy, not only forgave a murderer, a persecutor of the church like Paul, but called him and entrusted him with the ministry of the new covenant. As he writes in verse 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. The ministry here is Paul, the ministry, having this ministry. The ministry here Paul is talking about is the ministry of the new covenant. Before his conversion, he was a devout Jew. And the name Saul of Tarsus, it bred fear in the life of Christians because he wanted to exterminate the Christians and burn the churches and the, you know, the Christians. But as a devout Jew who wanted to keep the law for him, his adherence to the law was nothing more than a mirror that reflected the condition of his heart. And the law could not clean him up, but the grace of God could. And on the road to Damascus, he met grace. He met the mercy. So that's why he received the mercy, having this ministry by the mercy of God. As you see, mercy is God's quality of compassion, especially expressing God's forgiveness of human sin. In his mercy, God shields sinners from what they deserve and gifts them what, do not, what they do not deserve. In his grace, God gives us what we do not deserve. But in his mercy, he shields us from what we do not deserve. So in the life of Paul, as Paul looks back on his life, though in his testimony and biographies, he was the chief of sinners, a murderer, a persecutor of the church, God in his mercy met him on the road to Damascus and transformed his life forever. And having received God's grace and ministry, by the mercy of God, he knew what God saved him from. Paul, a murderer, a persecutor, saved and used by God. So whatever Paul thinks in terms of his hardship, the persecution, the imprisonment, he thinks in light of, I do not deserve to be in the ministry. I was a persecutor. I was a murderer. But God called me. So that's why he writes, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. So the question this morning is, what has God saved you from? When you think of your life, what has God saved you from? I remember last year speaking at a camp, speaking and uh, counseling at a camp. After every preaching session, we did group counselings, and there were groups of people who, in some sense, were just unwilling, or there was something bothering them that they just could not give their life to Jesus Christ. And as we were doing a group counseling, there was a sister, a lady, a young lady, who had a notepad listing down all the list of things that she had done wrong and perhaps thinking, this is too much, this is too much. And as we're asking her, how can we pray for you? She looks at the list and say, is it true that God can truly forgive me? And my answer was an astounding yes. If you repent, if you accept God's mercy, if you accept His forgiveness, of course, and there she accepted the Lord Jesus Christ because God is merciful. So this morning, if you're in the brink of losing heart, giving up, what has God saved you from? He is a merciful God. Remind yourself that God is merciful. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Every morning when we set foot from our bed to the floor, his mercies renew every morning. And this has been true of my life. I've done things that I'm not proud of, but I've had to tell myself, God is merciful. I will live in light of the fact that he has saved me. I'm merciful. I am safe. And that helps us. God is merciful. So Paul, in his ministry, does not lose heart because, number one, 
because he has received God's mercy. But secondly, and most importantly, I want to focus on, we do not lose heart because God has entrusted, oh, because we have received God's glorious treasure, or God has entrusted us with his glorious treasure. We read in verse 7, as I read earlier, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the all-surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, we see, as Jesus tells a story where he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure. It's like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And, in, and then in his joy, went back and sold everything he had and bought the field. The kingdom of heaven is a treasure worth giving away everything that we have. Treasure. We have this treasure. Growing up as a kid, the word treasure would greatly excite me as my mind would go to treasure chests filled with gold and rubies and diamonds hidden away somewhere in the cave or in a mountain somewhere. Or on my birthdays, my mother would make us play games of treasure hunts where we, me and my friends would run for hours and hours finding clues. And the treasure was no gold or diamond or gems, but it was simply candies and toys or chocolate. But that was treasure for me at a time. Or growing up, I remember reading the news where people with wanton greed and hunger for treasure and wealth would go to great lengths to get treasure. In other words, they would even give their lives, sacrifice, take lives for, for treasure or wealth that they would want. Gaining treasure comes at a great cost and sacrifice at times. Gaining a treasure comes at a great cost and sacrifice at times. The question this morning is, if in the physical realm, if people can go through great lengths to gain treasure, which will soon rot and decay, how much more for you and I will it benefit us if we are fully committed to the treasure that God offers us? So here we have, we see Paul says, we have this treasure. That treasure that Paul is talking about is given in verse 6. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is the treasure that Paul is talking about. God who has shown in our hearts, the very God who said, let the light shine in Genesis is the very God who said, let light shine out of darkness to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God that shines in the face of Jesus Christ. And here we see that Paul is reflecting on his conversion as he was on his way to Damascus, on his way to put an end to the Jesus movement. The Christians, according to him, were the people who turned the world upside down, and he wanted to exterminate the Jesus movement. And as he was on his way to Damascus, a glorious light struck him. One preacher said the glorious light was brighter than the noonday sun, and he strikes him down. And one preacher put it best. Everybody saw the light, but Paul saw the face in the light. Everybody heard the thunder, but Paul heard the voice in the thunder. And that day, treasure seized him, and his life was never the same. And you know who he met? He met Jesus Christ. He came in contact with Jesus Christ. So in other words, this treasure is the light of the gospel that shines in our hearts to bring a saving knowledge of Jesus. It is the power of God at work in us as he awakens us to know him, to love him, and to follow him. And for Paul, when he received this treasure, he could not contain it. It was too much for him at the time. He could not contain it. It became his breath, his life, his devotion to love his Savior, to serve his Savior, and if need be, to die for his Savior. He was consumed by this treasure up until his very last breath. And he would talk about this treasure over and over again he, as he writes to the Ephesians, to the Corinthians, to the, uh, to the uh, Philippians. And each time he would tell it, one preacher said it was like a fish story. It got bigger and bigger and better and better. It's almost like uh, people asking me, as Pastor Jeff said, I got married this year in May. It's like for the first time, people asking me about my wife. As I would tell it often, the story would get bigger and better and better. But it fails in comparison to Paul's view of the treasure. Whenever he would talk of God and what he has done, it got bigger and bigger and better and better because that's what the treasure does. And it possesses and it possessed him and took him to places 
where he particularly would not have gone. So the question is, when did this treasure get a hold of you? When was the last time your heart leaped for joy because of this treasure? When was it? Or has this treasure gone cold because you've not been valuing it? I remember the first time I got a hold of this treasure. I was a seven-year-old growing up in India. We were in the capital, Delhi. There was a war between India and Pakistan. Nuclear threats. As a seven-year-old, I could not sleep, and I was just afraid for my soul. I wanted salvation. I remember praying and praying, but nothing happening. Until one night, I was praying <coughs> and singing with my mom. And these words from the hymn just really struck a chord in my heart. It was a song. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith. I received my sight, and I am happy all the way. Seven years I was, and now around 20 years later, I am still happy all the way. Why? Because this treasure grows increasingly glorious, immeasurably more beautiful and brighter, and I fall in love with it time and time again. The treasure, why? Because when I am faithless, he remains faithful. He is the only constant. The treasure, saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, is a treasure that you and I have, that you and I behold. It's the only constant in our lives. We have this treasure. You and I have this treasure, but the question is, where is this treasure? Where is this treasure place? As we read, we have this treasure in jars of clay. In jars of clay. Jars of clay basically means vessels made of earthenware, mud, that were weak, fragile, and breakable. Here, Paul wants us to see the contrast. The treasure is immeasurably glorious, infinite, and eternal, but the vessel, the jar, is weak, mortal, fragile, breakable, and replaceable. We have this treasure, the glorious treasure, eternal treasure of God, where? In jars of clay. And that's how Paul would describe himself. I am just a jar of clay, a jug of mud, replaceable, breakable, weak, fragile. But some way, somehow, God had placed in me the treasure. God places his treasure, not in nature, not in mighty animals, not in the angels, but in mortal men like you and me, created in his image, to simply show this, that the all-surpassing power is from God. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the all-surpassing power is from God, which basically means Paul cannot boast. He cannot take credit for anything that he has done in life and in ministry. Even I, at the end of my sermon, some of you may think I did a good job or a bad job. Even that means I cannot boast. I cannot take credit because it is his treasure in my weak vessel because the all-surpassing power is from God. But may I tell you this, the degree to which we humble ourselves and fully yield ourselves to God will determine the degree to which God displays His all-surpassing power in us. Because all-surpassing power simply means the possession of abundance of power beyond the ordinary. And that was where the strength for Paul came. Strength in the midst of persecution. Strength in the midst of shipwreck. Strength in the midst of imprisonment. Strength in the midst of a threat to his life. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the all-surpassing power is from God and not us. As you know, I spent seven years at Moody, Moody Bible Institute and Theological Seminary, and I'm very thankful for my time there. The founder, D.L. Moody, was an evangelist, and unlike most founders, he has an unlikely story. Moody, like most founders or president, wasn't a, you know, a scholar, wasn't, wasn't a PhD or a doctorate, but he was simply a high school dropout. And the saying goes, if Moody were around today, and he, if he would apply to the school that he founded, he would not get accepted because he had, did not have the credentials. But when you look at his life and ministry, his contribution since 1886 in training of thousands of pastors and missionaries with free education, his vision surpasses that of many. So the question becomes, how did Moody become so fruitful and successful in ministry? I have a guess, as we read in his biography, uh, it writes, he was attending an all-night prayer in Dublin, Ireland, 
and he heard an evangelist utter these words where it says, the world has yet to see what God can do with and for and through and in a man who is fully and wholly consecrated to him. And Moody said to himself, by the grace of God, I will be that man. Though Moody was uneducated, though he was called crazy Moody by the kids that he would drag every Sunday morning to go to Sunday school, and though Spurgeon said he was the only man who could pronounce the word Jerusalem in one syllable, I don't know how you even do that. <laughs> but he simply committed himself, in the words of a pastor, to be a warm-hearted devotee to the gospel of Jesus Christ. He knew he was nothing but a crackpot, a clear jar, a clay jar, but he was never ashamed of the treasure, the gospel that God has placed inside of him. That is it. He knew he was nothing but a crackpot, a clay jar, a vessel breakable, but he simply committed himself to be a warm-hearted devotee to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yes, the world has yet to see what God can do with and for and through a man who is fully and wholly consecrated to him. This is what, church, you and I desperately need today. In a culture that is becoming so increasingly hostile to the gospel, we need young men and women, pastors, missionaries, that are fully committed to the gospel of Jesus Christ because we are on mission for the church. And any half-hearted devotion, anything, we are going to crumble if not. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the all-surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. And that is why Paul doesn't lose heart. But lastly, we do not lose heart because God gives us an eternal hope. God gives us an eternal hope, as it reads in verses 16 through 18. Paul, for the second time in chapter 4, says, So we do not lose heart. We do not faint or throw in the towel. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Here, you may think that Paul is talking about the normal aging process. You know, with time comes decay. And some of you older folks, you may think you're young, but... How about today as you go home, pick up a high school yearbook and look at it. You're not what you used to be. <laughs> but Paul here is not talking about the normal aging process. He's talking about the rapid pace, his sacrifice for the gospel, the sleepless nights, the imprisonment, perhaps the malnutritious diet and everything that made him rapidly decay, his, his eyes getting dim, perhaps his back being bent. And that's why he writes, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Though Paul was suffering for the gospel, though he was in imprisoned for the gospel, God some way, somehow strengthened him in his grace and mercy. As one commentator has written, when God places his treasure in us, he does not give us immunity from suffering or persecution, but in his grace and mercy, he sustains us to go through everything, to go through every hardship. One pastor has said this, and I like that, and I want to apply it for my life. In any sport, basketball, football, baseball, by the time you're 30, 40, you are old, washed up, and they're ready for you to go away. But ministry, service of God, is the only thing you get better and better with age. So there is hope for me because of God's sustaining grace. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Whatever it is in the sight of eternity that we are going through in obedience for God, it is nothing but light and momentary in light of what God has in store for us. So it's a call for us to endure amidst the hardship. And lastly, as we look not to the things that are unseen, but the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. God wants us to put on a lens of eternity through whatever we go through so that in Jesus Christ we find our hope, we find our meaning, because whatever we go through in the midst of suffering for Jesus, it will not be in vain. Because the greater the suffering, the greater the grace. The greater the weakness, the greater the strength. The greater the sorrow, the greater the joy. The greater the fear, the greater the presence of God. And the greater the despair, the greater the hope. Because of the hope that we have in Jesus. Let me close with this. 
if there's somebody in my life that I know has been really defined by triumph and suffering, it would be my grandfather. Born and raised during the Second World War, the Japanese invaded India through Manipur, which is where I'm from. They dropped a bullet shell, which exploded in his eye. So thereupon, he got blind right away, went to school but never finished schooling, married but lost, three wives because of, you know, uh, decaying health. And since 10th grade, I would go to the city, come back, but every time I would see him getting older and older, decaying, his outer self was wasting away. But 2016, when I went back home, finishing my sophomore year at Moody, he called me to his room. His best friend, as someone who was wasting away with blindness and you know, deafness, was an audio Bible. He would listen to it day and night, and he would pray every day. I learned prayer from my grandfather. He would pray and pray and pray, morning, day, night, because of his blindness, he had nothing to do. But the only annoying thing about him was when I was home. What is the time? What is the time? Hundred times a day, what is the time? And sometimes I would have to hide. But this one day, he would call me and say, bring a pen and a paper, and I would write down. This is the verse and the song I once sung in my funeral. The verse was in 2 Corinthians 5.10, which says, the earthly tent will be torn down. God, but God will give us a new body. He knows he's almost done with his journey. He's decaying, even though he's blind. His eyes are open by the hope that he has in Jesus Christ. And he said, when you go back to Moody, the good Lord may take me any time. Remember that I will be with the Lord. Despite my limitations, everything, I've tried my best to honor the Lord. And I want you to, I want you to do the same. That was powerful for me. Because he's been beat down by life and suffering but he was clinging to the hope that he had in Jesus Christ. This is the hope that you and I have. Even when life has taken away your sight and senses and loved ones, when age and decay becomes your constant companion, when death comes calling with its cold grip, rest secure in the hope that Christ gives. In Jesus, we have hope for a world renewed and a glorified body no more affected by sin, pain, and death. Let me close with the words from the song. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So we do not lose heart because God has given us his mercy. He has entrusted us with his treasure. And lastly, because he gives us an eternal hope. Now let me move on to my presentation, my second assignment for the day, in light of what God is doing in India. So that is my beautiful wife. We just got married. It's been five months. So if you remember to pray for me, uh, marriage is work, but it's good. Her name is Grace. That is, that's my dad doing our wedding. That's me and her kneeling at the altar. And that's our beautiful family, me and my wedded bride. One thing about our wedding was that we had over a thousand people showing up and we ran out of food. So it was a bit, uh, you know, challenging because we had planned for 1,000, but more than 1,000 people showed up because they heard the news that there was food. So everyone was coming from everywhere <laughs> and there's no security guard. So such is the culture from which I come from. India, country of 1.37 billion people, and I'm located in the northeast of India, the blue, Manipur, right by Myanmar, and there are usually uh, 2,376 uh, unreached people groups, uh, so it's a country that is really ripe for the gospel, and I believe I'm strategically placed there. Part of the education I do is among the youths and children ministry through sports, Sports become an avenue of connecting with the young people, inviting them to church and sharing the gospel. And this year alone in 2021, we had 21 young people baptized. The, the way that worked out was in our camp, many were saved, but they were not baptized yet. But I talk on the importance of baptism in terms of your public declaration and commitment that you are truly a follower of Jesus Christ. It was a January morning, it was cold, but it was a test to their commitment that they were able to be baptized in the cold weather. 
We have a mission school that me, my mom, and my wife have been a part of, over 300 kids. This is me and my wife teaching a class. Uh, the way it works here is such that even though the fees are minimal, around you know, 10 to $15 a month, some families can't afford it. So by way of, uh, the way they do that is sometimes they'll bring a bag of charcoal or a rooster and say, hey, we don't have money. Can you please take this in place of the fees? And this is how we are meeting their needs, I would say. Equipping the church. Our church is over 130 houses now with around 600 members. We have around seven pastors, and our members, the way they uh, measure our pastoral ministry is house visitations. So they expect you to show up at their house to pray for them because they're not going to come reach out to you. So house visitations and fellowships and discipleship is one thing that we greatly do. Salvation camp in Shillong. I also have uh, opportunities to share in camps in different states of India. This was in Shillong, Meghalaya, that they call the Scotland of India. It was a beautiful area. One young man was by the name Steve. He was 21 year old, uh, doing law, a law degree. And this one time as I was sitting with him, he said, I can't accept the Lord, I'm full of hatred. I can't function without hatred and I can't forgive myself because his parents divorced at a very young age and also uh, he got abused, neglected growing up. But as he was looking for Bible verses to forgive himself, give me verses to forgive myself. And as I was praying with him and just uh, counseling him and loving on him, so to my surprise, on the testimony night, on the last night, he comes up and shares a sweet testimony. I don't know where he got it from. I'm Steve, I'm safe, watch me. So in a sense, he had you know, laid behind his past because he was a new creation in Jesus Christ. So we had a civil war in our area. This is as accurate as October 2024. 199 people died, 200 villages burned, 700 7,000 houses burned, and 360 churches burned, and around 40,000 displaced. This definitely affected our area because we are in an area that is close to the non-believers, and now there is a total ethnic geographical uh, separation where we can go into the territory where the capital is. So I had to, uh, you know, we have no access to the airport. This was the aftermath of it. Many people, including our past, two of our pastors were also affected. This was a a locality that is stone throw away from my area. And yes, when such times comes, I also got recruited once to patrol our border because if you let the enemy in, you know, you'll have to run and flee. So we have our cars filled with petrol and diesel. If they ever infiltrate, we have to flee. They gave me a gun, which is a double barrel. It took me around 15 seconds to load it. I've never shot a gun before except once when I was shooting with Pastor Jeff. I held it, the scope was very close to my eye, and the next thing I know, I'm bleeding. So, I know how, how good am I with guns, but I'm glad I didn't have to shoot that day. So because of it, our airport that used to be an hour away is now 16 hours away, and this is the type of road that we take. So it took a lot to get here, and this is the SUV vehicles on their way to the airport. And part of the way we serve the community is through free tutoring class because schools were closed when this conflict started. Schools were closed, businesses were shut down. For 6 to 8 a.m., we do tutoring classes. These are kids from a bordering village that were afraid, so they came over, and now we take care of them. And you may ask where the displaced people live. It's in relief camps, which are community halls, unfinished classrooms, and whatnot. So it's the plight of them. And these are some sick babies that we've been praying for and ministering to in terms of their medical bills and helping out. The young man on the bottom right, is uh, he has diabetes and could no longer afford his uh, medication, so he got blind. And he takes regular dialysis now, so he's really faded. We visited him once and helped pay for his medical expenses. A quick story, this was my pastor. When the conflict happened, one of our, my pastor friends his sister was uh, due for delivery, so he stayed back. And the young people, you know, came and tried to take him away. But in the, because of God's grace, his uh, brother works in the India, Indian army. And as they, were, uh, it, as they were in the verge of abducting him, the sirens rang and the army came and, you know, saved his life. So just God's uh, sovereign providence. This is the Bodo tribe in Assam that I've been working with my partner 
that's been doing, it's in a village of around 60 houses, out of which only five houses know the Lord. And this is the baptism. One of the needs there is the baptistry because the pond is uh, three miles away. And sometimes when it rains, it's a very bad weather. Lastly, why there is, this is my why of helping and ministering. The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. In, a war, in other words, Jesus identifies with the needy brothers and sisters. And if we did it for them, we did it unto Jesus. So thank you very much. I'm going to uh, pray for us. And then um, Gabe and his team are going to come over to sing. Let's pray. Thank you, dear Lord, for your great work that you are doing here at Grace and around the world, Lord. Even though we are hard-pressed, perplexed, Lord, we do not give up because we have you. We have the, you, are, you are our eternal hope. So I pray that you will awaken our hearts and our minds to the eternal hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand for the singing.
seated for just a second, please. You know, one of the, the prayers of our hearts uh, as pastors is that you would treasure Jesus Christ above everything else. And man, uh, life is different, and it is so much better when you do that. And um, I'm so excited for the opportunities that we have as a church ahead of us, the opportunities that we have to be citizens of the United States of America. Um, I get excited by, by turmoil and controversy. I don't know, that's just the way God has wired me, and I know that there are opportunities in front of us, even this week, that we don't even yet see. And so we pray, God, give us open doors and give us the courage to walk through those open doors when you present them to us. And I am so tremendously thankful for John. The fact that we, as, as Grace Baptist Church, get to have global partners that are doing the same work that we're doing right here in Batavia. They're doing it all over the globe is just amazing. So, I, John, I hope someday soon we get to visit you and, and serve alongside you just like you have done so well here. Thank you for the rich blessing that you've been to us and for bringing the word and refreshing our hearts. We really appreciate that. May God bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile upon you and be gracious to you. May he show you his favor and give you his peace. Have a great week. Thank you.